Hello and welcome to another rousing edition of Trending Topics with BB. I am your humble host, Brooke Brown, hence the BB. Well, we are back for another exciting episode, but before I get into that, I want to run down the housekeeping as quickly as possible. If you have not, please log on to the official website for this podcast, which is TrendingTopicsWithBBPodcast.com. There you will find all past, present, and hopefully future episodes of this podcast. And also, if you're subscribed, or if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That could be Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, MixCloud, Player FM, TuneIn, basically wherever this podcast can be found throughout the World Wide Web. Please subscribe. And once you have subscribed, please leave a favorable rating It helps this podcast uh, be found by other listeners, and it helps climb the charts. That way, we are not in an abyss that is the internet without any interaction. I would appreciate you leaving a favorable rating and comment. And this is primarily for those that are on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. But anywhere where ratings can be left, please... If you enjoy the pod, leave a rating. Even if you don't enjoy the pod, just leave a comment rating. Um, It helps. Uh, But along those lines, uh, I also want to remind you that if you want to uh, contact the pod, if you have any suggestions, comments, questions, or concern, the official email address is ttwithbbpod at gmail.com. All of this will be linked in this episode's description. Now, without further ado, I have another great conversation with somebody that I've been a fan of for a while. Uh, As you have or will figure out, I am a huge trans music fan, and I'm on this rampage to learn the stories and histories and uh, learn more from those that uh, create music, those that are DJing, and so uh, my guess on this episode is Ben Gold, who ironically uh, was very accommodating in his uh, willingness to do this chat. I really appreciate uh, him taking time out of his schedule and fitting me in prior to the gig he had here in Scottsdale, Arizona uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, But without further ado, I really don't want to ruin this conversation I had with Ben Gold. This episode of Trending Topics with BB is brought to you by Teeth Powder 2.0. Have you been looking for a toothpaste alternative that does not contain fluoride? Do you have sensitive teeth, bad gums, and overall bad oral hygiene? Then Teeth Powder 2.0 is the product for you. Now, Teeth Powder 2.0 was developed out of the necessity to strengthen enamel, get rid of plaque, clean gums, and keep your oral health in tip-top shape. This product is exclusive to my listeners, and you can get your own 70-gram order for just $12 by heading to teethpowder.com, then clicking on the Products tab. Again, that is teethpowder, T-E-E-F-P-O-W-D-E-R.com, then clicking on that Products tab to get your order. Now have a healthy and prosperous life with Teeth Powder 2.0. I appreciate you doing this. Um, so yeah, I've been kind of on a roll. Like I had Radeon 6 on a couple weeks ago. Karen McCauley was on before that. Christina Sky. Like I'm on a roll, but... Uh, oh, I like Christina. Yeah, I love her. She's a great DJ. Yeah. And I stayed at her house a couple of times when I was in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, a few years ago. I was on tour and she kindly lent me her spare room and yeah we hung out uh yeah she's genuine i re- really like her and yeah, as i said great dj right yeah really awesome she's yeah she representing she came in she comes to our pool parties in the summer here which she's a trooper so does cosmic gate a lot which is funny yeah. because it's like 100 over 105 and like this year i remember cosmic gates like gets on and they're like it's so hot we can't dj mm. but anyway <laughs> Because it was in the sun, so they were like, what is going on? That's hard. I yeah. Would, that it. happened to Paul Oakenfold one year, too. He came to the pool parties, and the way the sun came in, it, like, made the decks overheat, and okay. he was so mad. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's hard. I remember it, I played a State of Trance 600 in uh, Kuala Lumpur, and, 
Yeah, I played just before the sun went down. Uh, I think I played the opening set, and on the, yeah, and the sun was direct. It, the sun was hot, was hard to deal with, but the humidity that came with that. And this video, yeah, you just check out YouTube. Um, <laughs> it was the last show of a long tour that I done in that I was on in Australia. And we did KO on the way back, and I only had a grey T-shirt. It's a rookie, rookie move, really, not to wash my clothes as I was going. That, that's what I do now if I'm away for you know, a long period of time because uh, I have to travel carry on. I, I can't check luggage in. It uh, just adds a lot more time to, yeah. to your journey when you land. And um, if a flight gets delayed or cancelled, then you're... You risk losing, losing your, your luggage. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's happened a couple of times. I've never touched wood. I haven't lost any luggage, but uh, I've landed and my luggage has not been there. Um, but yeah, you just, yeah, whatever. But yeah, great t-shirt. And I actually, I had to stop halfway through uh, and just kind of compose... Well, I say compose, I needed to compose myself because of how drenched, how knackered I was. Um, yeah, the sun was difficult. I, 105 here, uh, would imagine... Well, it's oh, it gets more than that here, okay. but my point being is that once it gets 100 here, you feel like you're in a furnace. Of course, a lot of people are like, well, it's a dry heat, but my point is you still feel like you're in an oven. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Whether it's... I, we might not have the humidity like other places, but I, I've done the I've done the complete opposite as well. Uh, I played in Montreal in the winter where it's like minus thirty, and they had this uh, they have a club there called Beach Club. Obviously, during the summer it's great, and then the evening uh, in the winter they tried out this new event. I can't remember the name of it, um, and yeah, it's minus thirty. So everyone's in ski gear, ski masks, ski clothes, and in the DJ booth you have heaters. And I had a guy on before me. I won't say who it is. Um, but the cold crashed his laptop. Like, it just wouldn't charge anymore. So they said, well, can you go on early? I was like, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but then one of the heat, the heater uh, directly in front of my feet just broke, like, halfway through or during the set. And I, I was just trying to move my feet just to keep... It was turning into ice cubes. So it, it became... It became a, a much more difficult challenge. Why would they even have an event when it's that cold, though? I think it's yeah, just in Montreal, like Montreal, Toronto, well, anywhere east coast, kind of northeast, um, where half the year they have great weather and half the year they don't. It's like, well, why shut our party life just because of the weather? Let's do things or let's create something which people will come out to. Um, but it, that's cold. They have Igloo Fest there, which is a more of a techno kind of thing, and it's exactly the same. Um, as the, a similar, it's the same concept as the dr- event I played. I guess if you're dancing, you don't feel it as much. Maybe I don't know. I, listen, I felt it. I, I, <laughs> I, I can assure you. Although there were heaters, uh, yeah, all, all 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 around the DJ booth, the one the one uh, by my feet that that broke. Um, yeah, my feet were so cold. But yeah. Oh. I, I've done both extremes. <laughs> I, I prefer just in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Comfortable. So one of my main questions I always ask is kind of what initially got you into trance? Like where did your background start? A lot of people come, I've had people come from a classically trained music to or just loving the genre. What, is, what was your background? So I reckon my answer, you wouldn't have heard my answer before. Um, so my dad was a DJ uh, who featured in the DJ Man Top 100, uh, Top 20 for three years. Uh, he also had a, he ran a nightclub in London called Peach. And Peach was responsible for booking Armin Tiesto and Ferry Corson in England. Yeah. Uh, or in London, well actually in England uh, for the first ever time. And they booked everyone, Cosmic Gate, Paul Van Dyke. Um, and yeah, it was a weekly party and, um, it was, yeah, sort of early 2000s when Trance was just kind of coming through. Mm-hmm. Ferry was releasing records like Punk, System F, Out of the Blue. Um, it was after Goriello though? Uh, it was a kind of around that kind of time. Um, I can't, t- I can't tell you the exact dates of the Goriello well, no, releases. Well, but it was just but kind of it's a, the era. It's in that era, yeah. And although my dad wasn't, he went on to, he became a trance DJ because that's the way the music went. He was predominantly like a progressive DJ, really, when progressive was not what we know it as now. It was uh, progressive trance, John Digweeds, 
um, Sasha and Digweed. Sasha, yeah, Sasha and Digweeds. Um, so yeah, that was my uh, that was my entry level uh, into trance. Um, and then when I was sixteen, I went to Ibiza with a friend of mine and his family. And I think I'm kind of blessed with um, good genes. I don't I don't age. I haven't aged that. Uh, I've aged well, I think. So when I was 16, I looked 14. So I couldn't get into any clubs when I went to Ibiza, which was really frustrating. But I ended up going to Café Del Mar, Café Mambo. Wow. Uh, the, 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 the free events and the, yeah, where, where you can, anyone can go. And yes, all the likes of Judge Jules, Cole Cox, Pete Tong. Um, and yeah, I just, just, I just got the bug. I just didn't, I, was, I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. And then when I got back home from that holiday, I, my dad was able to hook me up with some Gemini turntables and he was sponsored by Vestax, uh, which was a kind of leading brand in, uh, yeah, mixers uh, and yeah. Uh, turntables so I had this basic setup and that was it really uh, and then I did it I sort of mixed at home for a year and I really then I wanted to get into production um, I'd, by that time I'd already met Ferry and Armin and I remember Ferry telling me how important it was to make music um, and uh, yeah the JP2000 synthesizers that he was using and to create this big super source sound and it just kind of like yeah it just it made me ex- it was exciting. So I went to college, I studied music technology, which didn't teach me anything really. Um, it gave me a good, uh, no, actually, hold a minute. I can't say it didn't teach me anything <laughs> because, because of course it did. Did it, did it teach me how to DJ? No. Did it teach me how to make music? No. But what it did teach me was how to, um, how to record a band how I would go about running a record label, music management. So like the business side of things. The business side, uh, figuring out the, uh, the, the acoustics in, in, in a room. Um, yeah, mic positions when you're recording a guitar. Uh, yeah, th- this, th- this kind of stuff. I wanted it and I thought it might be a bit more hands-on uh, in the studio because that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to make music. Um, and... But anyway, it, it was great. It was good. I used it. I could have gone on for further education. I didn't. Um, there was a record shop, a vinyl shop called Dot Vinyl, that at, at, at the time was one of, if not the biggest online store uh, for vinyl. And this Kev, he, uh, he owned it. He was the buyer as well. And he, yeah, he just had access to, every, to all the promos. So his shop was... You know, regarded as one of the best, and he just happened to live where I lived, and he opened up a record store. Uh, so where he went from having uh, working out of his garage in his in his home, he opened a shop, and shop was doing really well. And I used to go in there a lot. Uh, I never had to buy records because my dad got all the promos, so I used to get the doubles uh, that he used nice. to get. Plus, I moved to I moved to CD relatively quickly. Uh, I think by 17, 17, yeah, about between 17 and 18, I was fully on CD. Uh, so just at the back end of the vinyl era. And, uh, but vinyl was still selling. It was, it, it, especially in house music. And Kev uh, from Dot Vinyl came to me with a proposition uh, and an idea really. It was, he said, do you want to come and work for me? Work in a studio out at the back of the record shop? And your job is to make three bootlegs a week of, yeah, I will tell you what records you're going to bootleg, and then we'll, we'll have a press and distribution deal. We'll get them pressed, we'll sell them in the shop. And then that's what we did, and then we started selling them in the shop, and then online, and then all of a sudden we were shipping them worldwide. And as we end up selling like 100,000 units uh, of, yeah, of, you know, say, uh, one year's worth of work in the studio. Um, and then yeah, in my in my, I used to, I didn't have a studio set up at that time, so I would get I would get there at six a.m. I would get access to the shop early. I'd work for three hours on my, on trance, work nine till five on the bootlegs, and then I'd work from five till midnight on the tr- on trance, and then go home sleep. And then that was it. And that's kind of how I learned 
how to use Logic, which is the software that I use. Um, and then I fell into a ghost production uh, position. I was making music for other people in trance. It wasn't really the plan to do that, but it, the money was good. And funny enough, I worked, I wrote all the music for all the female trance DJs. That was never a plan either. It just it just happened that way. Um, Which and I, there's not many of them. Not now there's not, no. But at the time there was. Um, I had five very regular clients. One in particular who had a very good name for herself. And yeah, it was... It was I just sat in the studio and made music all day. And, and, and I loved it. And I wasn't really focused on my stuff at that point. Um, I was earning way more money than any any of my friends. I was doing what I wanted to do. I, I worked for myself. Um, and then, yeah, it wasn't until 26 that I was able to make the transition from ghost production into my own uh, career without there being a noticeable money drop. Um, that's one thing I was really cautious about. Uh, I invested in a house really early on, which was smart. Um, but there's responsibility, you now have a mortgage. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but yeah, uh, I, I, also I was making music that I didn't want to release myself. So it was, I was trying to find time to create something new for Ben Gold. Um, and then that's when I, yeah, bumped into Gareth Emery and that's how I got signed to Garuda. Um, and then just kind of never looked back really. So, kind of, my one question that came from all of that, I want to go back a little bit. So, when you were 16, and you were like, mom, dad, or whatever, I want to do this, they were very, obviously coming, that he was a DJ, and well, he well known, he, there was never like, an apprehensive, for you, going that path, like, did he see it as potential or did he see it as well you're passionate about it I'm not going to stand in your way what can can you remember kind of like the path when you yeah um when my it sparked in you, you know? yeah um my mom and dad divorced when I was 11 uh, I've got two younger brothers um uh, my mom it was at a time where um my mom uh, was, was quite poorly um she was quite sick um, that was a bit of a, uh, it was around, yes, when I was 16, 17, 18, um, yeah, some family issues or, or kind of whatever. Um, so my mum at that point was open for me doing it, but also wanted to make sure that I did my studies. Um, my dad on the other side, on the other hand was in his kind of prime and perhaps not there to give me the complete guidance that I needed, which is probably why I ended up, um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe that's why I ended up ghost producing. Maybe that's why I ended up working in a, in a record shop. Um, however, I think it was probably the best. I, I wouldn't change my, my path. Um, but I think my dad recognised a talent, um, both in production, which he it was a skill that he did not have, um, and I was playing, I was, at that time, London was full of parties, regular parties, and I was playing all of them, and I kind of, yeah, just built up a name, and I was able to have access to these, all the brand new music, which no one else had, so I had a, I had a, a bit of a, a head start in that sense. Right. Um, Simon Patterson was someone who I met when I was 16, and he was, I think, 19, and... We were kind of in a, uh, yeah, we not in the same group, but he was. He used to work for Judge Jules, and uh, I did my work experience at Judge Jules, Judge Jules's DJ agency. Hey, do you know who Judge Jules mm -hmm. is? Okay, um, legendary Radio yeah. One DJ, and um, so yeah, I think I just had people around me that kind of saw, saw a potential and saw, uh, yeah, that, that I had something. But as I said, I didn't put any of that to use until I was 26, really. Um, I released some music, but not really. <clears throat> I didn't 
I was making music all day, every day. And I was just like, well, if I'm going to release a Ben Gold record. I can't just write that in two days. I, because I know, the, I know what I give to other people in two days. Right. I need to find something that's really magical, really special, and, something that, and, and a style that excites me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, just, yeah. I think when, when I handed Gareth Emery these two, this, this, this record called uh, Sunstroke, um, which was a record I released on Marcel Woods' label under the name B Gold. Um, I think that's kind of when it all started clicking for me, and that I kind of realised, okay, I can I can leave this studio life behind, and I can actually maybe now start pursuing a DJ career. Um, but up until then, I was perhaps blinded by the money. Um, I'd said investment. I bought a house, and uh, yeah, I was the man of the house. My mum and dad were separated. My dad was travelling the world as a superstar DJ. And my mum was at home sick. So I kind of, I, 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 I took that role on. Uh, so financially I paid a lot to live at home. And I think it kind of changed my the way that I looked at going into the music industry. When I was 17, 18, I didn't have any of those responsibilities. It was like, I want to be a DJ. I want to tour the world. I want to do, I want to right. do all of this and, and and everything that come with it. Um, but then, yeah, things changed and then my perspective of it changed, which um, just meant, I, yeah, I guess I didn't really feel that I was, uh, I guess I didn't even want it. I didn't want it enough between 21 and 25 I think I, I, yeah, I was probably content just making music and being at home. But also, I didn't have that special sound that I was looking for. Really? But when I got that, that's when I felt that it kind of, I knew where I was. I knew what I wanted. I'd grown up. Right. Um, and then, yeah, I felt that I was kind of ready. And then when I had a number one supporter, like Gareth Emery, all of a sudden I had this A-lister that was asking me for music and that was putting me on his label and putting me on his shows and yeah and then all of a sudden it just kind of it just it, from then on it moved really quick so when you met Ferry and Armin in the beginning and they they this kind of goes with the question that uh, somebody in the family asked me to ask you um, that's one thing people when they want to start a career they're like do I do DJing or do I produce or do I do both at the same time? And I think right now every, a, people are wondering what the path should be because everybody's had a different path. They either was a DJ first, produce second, or produce, then DJ. Yeah. So when they told you that, do you still kind of go by that? Like, yeah, producing. Obviously, you, you came from a different path as some even other people, but do you think both at the same time do you think or do you just depends because a lot of people are really like into the dj side and the music and like just love listening to music and others just really want to make it so so the era that i was brought up in or brought up around uh was you you have to be a a very good dj and at that time, it wasn't that important to make. And when I say the time, I'm talking about my dad's kind of era, say that late 90s, early 2000s. It wasn't as, it, yeah, there were not many. It was the likes of Ferry and Armin who were coming through who were doing both. So the, 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 it was, it was, uh, it wasn't until then, really, that it kind of became important. Um, I was always confident in my DJ ability, um, mixing, uh, energy levels, transitions, knowing my record box, knowing what, what tunes I had, what would go with what, and this was all before mixing in key, before you started, before you started mixing harmonically. Um, that software wasn't available back then. <laughs> Um, you said you were CDs. Yeah, I was. I was CDs. I used to had this. I had this big two fifty CD wallet, and each record, each track had uh, uh, was on one CD. So I had hundreds of CDs. But I but I knew where they were, just like an old school record uh, DJ would know where his vinyls are in his box. 
so I knew that I could flick through and I knew where you know what would go with what based on what the crowd were doing so I came from that background um, but as, yeah as I said earlier I started production very very quick very quickly um, but I think nowadays like See, now that it's, it's changed, it's different now. It's different in the sense that, okay, let's take set lengths. Mm -hmm. Average set, or the only set length at a festival. Mm -hmm. Not only. But majority. 80, 85% <laughs> is, an hour. Or, is an hour. Right. Now, an hour's... Not that much. Not that much. And really, nowadays, like, let's cram as much into that hour as we can... Now I, you know, there's no way that any anyone could do, not no way, but I, I would bet money that the majority of these DJs have a very good idea of how that hour is going to sound. So is that DJing or is that performing? Now you have to be a performer before you're a DJ. You have to be a performer as a DJ. But if you're just playing a, a one-hour slot every week. You know, what's to say that you can't be sat, you're not sat on your plane or the private jet or in a hotel or, or in an airport, you know, waiting for a flight, figuring it all out. So when you get there, you just kind of plug it in and go. But that's kind of how it's, how it's gone now. So I don't think it's DJing. It's not DJing, traditionally DJing. I think anyone who can play an extended set of above four hours, say three hours, I think that's a, that that is a, that that is a good amount of time where someone has to be a DJ in order to fulfil that time and make it sound good and take people on a journey with you. Um, but where but where we're at now, or well, rather where the scene has gone and where we find ourselves, you've got kids who are producing music who maybe have never even stepped into a club. Who are now closing ultra? Martin Garrix, for an example, mm -hmm. sixteen years of age, came out with this mega hit. Animals completely blew up. But he He's, had the support, though, of like Hardwell. Yeah, he had and the support, but, and... but we're talking about the DJ and the producing thing. So he yeah. produced that record, but had he played? Had, he's only sixteen, so he couldn't have played in That's true. hardly any clubs. Right. Legally, anyway. Right. In order to have that, gain that experience of playing to no one. And when you, what you and then all of a sudden he's closing, or he's playing the main stage ultra. Yeah. And let's not Number one, two years in a row. Let's yeah. not take anything away from any of these guys that do that. Right. Because that's just how the scene is, and that's how the scene is now. Um, I'm not anal, I'm not anal at all to sit here and sort of say, well, Screw them, you know. They don't yeah. know what they're doing, because it's just it's just it's just how it is now. Um, there are places where well, we we said before this interview, see Marcus play for eleven hours, or I play well, for yeah, six yeah. hours, or yeah, you know, and you do yeah. these long sets, and it's just great that, that or I'm that, playing at all untold for like yeah. nine hours this year or whatever. Let's not forget that. Yeah, um, and I was I saw Armin play eight hours when I was, you know, when I was. Still a ghost producer. You know, I'd go to God's Kitchen and be the first one in there when, <clears throat> when he was in there starting his set, and I'd be the last one leaving. Um, and I think that I mean, of course, you look at Armin Untold two years on a trot. I think now. Maybe. Yeah, last the year before it was six hours. I think this last year it was nine hours. See, <clears throat> he he. he but he's he, something he, about he's, that that festival that gets him to just keep playing and playing and playing, I, even I, though he was only just delayed for two or whatever. I was lucky. I played there last year, and uh, it it's true, on my list. <laughs> it truly is an amazing festival. Everything from uh, yeah how it's run to uh, just yeah the people on the ground um, and just the the vibe on the on on we played. Uh, I played back to back with Omnia. Actually, that's where. The whole Future Code project kicked off from. Uh, that's where it came. That's where the idea came from, and it was an amazing event. Uh, so Untold is definitely one for everyone to check out if they can. It's truly, truly special. Um, yeah, Ruben made a joke on one of the state of trance. He's like, "You're gonna play 24 hours next year, yeah. Armin." 
It was really funny. Wow, funny. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I did. I think it's it's just how it is. Uh, but you don't have to be a DJ now to be booked to play uh, a club or a festival or go on tour. You don't have to be a DJ. Uh, you technically you are a DJ if you're mixing records together for an audience. That is a DJ. But maybe, what does it mean to be a DJ? Maybe that's changed a little bit. Or maybe a lot, depending on how you look yeah. at it. So, so do you agree that maybe the, the idea, <clears throat> I guess when we talk about like the EDM bubble of, I guess the US, of like DJs, it went from the old school <clears throat> about the music and dance and have a good time, the raving, to now it's like, huge festivals everybody's like there for that one person or two people or whatever it is and it's changed the vibe because it's not it's less about <clears throat> the music itself sometimes and more about the show yeah yeah how it looks the production yeah visually uh how it looks um yeah no i do i do think it is i also think maybe uh it's not maybe it goes a bit deeper Perhaps maybe it's more client or customers want more for their money, and they if they're going to be spending two hundred and fifty dollars for an EDC ticket, I, I I don't don't I don't know if that's how much it is, but I'm guessing that if you go to Vegas, a little bit more. ED, okay, <laughs> I did it twice. <laughs> okay, so for ultra, and if you're going to go to those kind of shows, yeah, you, you you want to have value for money, so you want to be seeing, you know, currently you'd want to be seeing what Marshmello, Calvin Harris. Uh, Martin Garrix, you know, you're going to be seeing, uh, and then obviously, yeah, all, all the other subgenres w- within electronic dance music. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's that. Maybe, I mean, I've noticed a, a decline, um, kind of, not. Well, I guess, yeah, maybe a sort of a cr- like globally, where there used to be a lot more club shows than what there are now. Just promoters not in trance or in dance well, music. I'm I only I'm in trance, so I can only really talk about trance. Um, but just yeah, there aren't as many uh, club shows available now. There's also uh, the market's very busy. Like so, there's a lot more uh, DJs, or producers, or acts, or whatever we'll call them. There's a lot more. Do you think it's now. saturated or oversaturated? Possibly. There's, you know, promoters uh, have a risk every time they put a show on. So then they have to then figure out, okay, well, what lineup's going to do well. But then some some DJs and artists get overlooked because maybe they're not with the right agent. Agents are only going to take on so many DJs. So it's kind of when you start looking at it, you're sort of thinking, oh, maybe. Uh, someone said to me once, not not talking about music, but there are hundreds and thousands of undiscovered geniuses, and I guess you'd like there's there's definitely some truth in that. I think that you do. It's a combination. You have to work hard. You know, you do need some kind of talent, but you just need, you need luck as well. You really you need to have uh, a proportion of luck, which will just timing. You know, that will fall into luck. Um, in order to get a gig uh, and get and get and get on these shows, uh, and then when you get on the shows, you have to make sure that the ticket sales are good. Um, it's definitely not. Instagram makes this job look the best job in the world, and it is the best job. Or social media in general. Yeah, or social media in general, and it is the best job in the world. But then, how I look at my job, it, my job is not just the hour and a half performance that I do tonight or the festival shows that I'm going to do in the summer Omnia and I let's talk about future codes yeah, it kind of leads on to that quite well ever since we were announced to close the state of trance well not even announced as soon as we were booked to close ASAP main stage in Holland in two weeks we decided that right we have a great opportunity now to showcase a whole load of new music, which we, yeah, which um, Future Code was a bit unexpected. It was expected, we decided that we were going to do more back-to-backs. 
because after we played Untold and Electronic Family last year, we were looking, we were thinking, well, what we're going to play? We were like, well, between us, we have so much music. We don't have to play anyone else's music. We have a similar sound. We have a similar taste. I agree. So we decided that we were just going to make do a producer, a producer set that was kind of balanced. One of his, one of mine, one of his, one of mine, and it kind of balanced out pretty well. So then, yeah, when we decided when we got booked for Ace Up, we're like, well, we're not playing anyone else's music. We're just playing our own music, and we have to create something um, like brand new. So yeah, my job uh, is not just that. ASOT set, although that's what everyone's going to see. We've been doing this for like two and a half months of solid studio work. Uh, I'm glad you know, he's coming here next week. So. Yeah, he's coming next week. <laughs> yeah, um, it worked out really well. <laughs> with yeah, with with vocals and uh, yeah, working out contracts and um, branding and you know all, all, all this and um, so yeah, it's certainly not. Social set social media make, makes it look unreal. Um, yeah. But it took me twenty hours travelling today to get here. Um, I, know. I slept I for two hours, <laughs> having a wonderful chat with you. And then I'm gonna um, then yeah then I'm gonna play later. Um, but yeah, social media kind of didn't see that. And I think people need to realise what they're, what they're getting in for. Um, yeah, see losing Avicii this year and Hardwell. Yeah, I was gonna ask about kind that. Kind of uh, uh, resting for a bit. So so. Now it's kind of my thing. I don't know if you watch the Avicii documentary, but um, I was a fan because I just thought musically that guy just had, he was a genius. And what he produced kind of took the boundaries of the subgenres down. It was like, oh yeah, this vocal that you've heard and maybe yesteryear goes great with this beat, and it was just you can't not hear that in your sound when you think of a beat anymore. And it, but what got me, what I had already known, and that it was in the documentary, is that the beast. That's what we were talking about the DJ versus producer thing, and like EDM or the the popularity of dance music as a, as a whole. When it starts to be like he. In that documentary, they said in, like, two years he did 800 shows. Nobody can survive that. Like, how could you, like, I felt, like, I was just angry watching that documentary because I, for him and that, what what it did to him. And, and like, even me as a fan was, like, what made me mad is the people around him that were, like, no, we want you to keep going. This, this train needs to keep going. And he kept saying, I want to take time off. I need time off for me. <clears throat> and you see him just struggling or in the hospital and they're like trying to book gigs and he's like I can't feel my legs right now like mm. it was just what do you think about like the mental health of it all because <clears throat> as fans we love the music it, it meant like music has saved my mental health but I also know as a human you guys need time off you need time to recharge or do what you need to do and I know you guys have rigorous traveling schedules so what do you feel about this like train of when somebody's popular we're just going to get them as many gigs around the world non-stop because the money keeps flowing well I mean like <clears throat> it's just a hard I know it's hard at the, but... begin, at the beginning of the last year or the back end of sorry not last year at the back end of 2017 uh, someone really close to me uh, was going through uh, something, yeah, which, something new, and at the time we didn't kind of know what it was, and it figured out, we, it, it was, uh, you know, anxiety, um, panic attacks, and that had such a, an effect on not just their life, but my life, um, and at the time, you just do what you need to do for that person just to kind of get through. Um, you need to be the rock, you know. Um, so I kind of, I've, I've experienced firsthand on, on how powerful uh, and disruptive 
and problematic and all oh, yeah stressful that mental health and w- what it brings to someone and how it can disrupt someone's life and it was just when I was writing Sound Advice chapter one that Roxanne Emery wrote, sent me a song called Stay which just connected I could connect with I don't really know what she, well I do know what she wrote it about but you can but you can everyone listens to it, it, it yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone listens everyone listens to it in a in a different perspective i listen to it, it from a mental health point of view and um yeah that that kind of got me through the that period of time that where i was um there for someone and then once they were fixed which they are. Good, that's good. Um, there was a time when I thought that, oh, well, maybe the fixer now needs to be fixed. Right. And there was definitely a time for me last year where, okay, just on the record, I never, I was never on uh, tablets. I never went to see a doctor either. Um, but there was certainly a period of time. I, so did this person. Um, yeah. And I made them go. Um, but there was certainly a period of time where I felt that, you know, perhaps I just need to have a bit of a break. Um, so towards, uh, yeah, kind of like last summer after Sound of Ice One, that's why I didn't go on tour with it. Yeah, I kind of noticed you yeah. didn't. Oh, that was a, that was my decision not to do it um, because I just didn't I didn't feel that that it was gonna fix. Maybe yeah, I didn't think it was gonna be the answer to uh, some some questions I was questioning about where I was at and whatever. So I just, yeah, I didn't go on tour with it. I kind of stepped out of the DJ tour life for like last year. Um, not all of last year, but certainly from May, well, since Sound Advice. So that came out in March or May, first release in March. So around April time, I just, didn't have a I didn't have a tour schedule until uh, October September September I started touring again and having that little time off it was only what four or five months uh, I moved to Amsterdam in that time I bought another house which is two very stressful things which probably wasn't the right just right timing <laughs> however it was because it gave me another focus and it gave me um, I'm you were gonna focusing say, on something. Yeah, I'm not going to say a lifeline because I was never, I was never, I wasn't, I wasn't in that darker place. Uh, I, I, I think I maybe just touched, touched on it a little bit, um, but maybe I'm lucky. Um, I didn't, uh, I never felt that I, that everything was collapsing around me, but I was able to identify that I needed just a bit of time where I wanted to get out of this DJ rap race and of touring and hotels and traveling and. Yeah, Um, so I did, Um, and then, yeah, then Future Code kind of of came around at... uh, At the right time? Just at the right time. Well, it actually came around at the time when I was about to start the production on Sound Advice Chapter 2, and that was the plan. I was, because that's, most of that's written, by the way. Uh, It's not all produced, but it's it's written. Um, And then, yeah, Future Code came along. Uh, And it was just a really, it was a breath of fresh air to be able to focus on something which was brand new. Um, So yeah, I think that, and now just for the, on the record, I I feel great now. Like I've, I feel rested. Um, And yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I think that it's maybe taken me back one or two steps in my career in terms of where I was at profile wise. Um, But if I carried on, I would have just fucked it, probably. Um, Do you think you would have led to a burnout? Probably, yeah. I mean, I'm not touring. Not to name I, names, I, but I feel like there are a few out there right now that I'm not touring, you can tell. <laughs> I'm not touring like other people are touring, you know. And I, well, I, I was. I was touring so much. Um, but yeah, since kind of sound of since the, I started sound advice in, I tell you what it was. I made this person go to the doctor. The day before I walked out the door to go and play Dream State in 2017. And 
that was a quite a definitive. That was that that, that was a real moment. That was because um, I felt when I when I when I came back from that weekend, and things were things had started to make some progress, as in doctors and prescriptions and stuff. I felt that that was a real breakthrough. I, it was a breakthrough. I'm just trying to think of the right word. I just, I, I could, I, I just felt like, you know what? I need a break. Yeah. I need a break for, to be there for someone else. And I just, yeah, I just wasn't fussed about going on Instagram and seeing how many likes I got or getting in or finding out from my agent where my next big tour is. I just, I just wasn't really that fussed about those things. So that's when I wrote Sound Advice. And it's not really a dance floor album. Yes, okay. The tracks of Alan Watts are, you know, one th- are a big dancehall record, but the vocal records Audrey, with Audrey Gallagher, there will be angels and stay that Roxanne wrote. I love that record. I don't even. To me, they're not dancehall records. Yes, they work on the dance floor, but they're not club records. They, I wrote them, I guess, when I was quite vulnerable, and I wrote them for me. And I guess that was maybe partly why. I, some of this, the, 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 the future call due, due to the success of you know maybe it came because I just I wrote it because I wrote it, wrote it for myself um, and then yeah so pretty much I, I kind of took some time just to I'd say I'd say I, I, I pretty much had a year out to be honest where I wasn't just like okay where are we going next what are we doing okay let's try and get into Asia right what do we need to do right let's get a remit you know all, all the the business side and the way that you plan these tours I just, I just I couldn't be fucked right. I just couldn't really be bothered um, and other things other things that were taking up my time right and I think like that, a human being exactly and I think that when you uh, um, you know when you do something you have to fully commit and I couldn't I couldn't juggle I couldn't juggle it all um, but you know what if I was faced with it again I'd do it all again um, and yeah going back to your question I think that perhaps it was quite good timing uh, I guess in this, uh, that it was nice to have a bit of a time off where I was at home on the weekends where I wasn't rushing to the airport I was doing 18 hour studio days to get things done crammed in between the weekends um, yeah so before we wrap up, um, we touched a little bit on Future Code. Yeah. Uh, like I said, Ami is coming next week here, which is fun. So, well, you guys are closing. So, like you just mentioned, it's all going to be brand new music, good stuff. Like, is it going to... Is it going to... Blow our minds? Yeah, I think it is going to blow your minds. And... It is as good as any Ben Gold record I put out. It's as good as any Omnia record that he's put out. And the whole process has been so fun. So much fun. He came over to to, to Amsterdam for a week. We spent a week in the studio. Uh, he produces as well. I So we were able to look at what, what our strengths were. And then I could work on stuff and he could work on stuff. But we've written everything together. Everything has been, we're in contact daily now, especially now, we're getting really close. But yeah, in, in contact. And we just, the idea was to, was to create, was to put our sounds together and just do, make, make music as best as we can. Um, listen, when you close it, when you close, or when you play any festival set, when, you, when you're turning up with at least half the set that's brand new, there's always an element of nerves, right? Especially when you're closing the biggest trance festival in the world. So I just hope that we've done it right. Um, it feels right. It feels right. It feels that we've, we have done it right. But two weeks and you'll know. Yeah. The whole world will know in two I'll weeks. I'll be watching the stream. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Um, I appreciate this. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And... Uh, yeah, the, the, these, this kind of interview is, is so much more uh, enjoyable, isn't it? Yes, I agree. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time.